There are a few topics in psychology that tend to have as much interest as motivation and emotion. After all, how many people do you think are watching this video right now wondering about why they tend to struggle with being motivated? How many people have let their emotions influence their thoughts and behaviors? Well, a whole lot of us is the answer to that question because this is part of just being a human. Like many other things that I talk about in this series, it isn't a matter of saying these issues are just human nature and there's nothing that we can do about it. It's about looking at ourselves and evaluating if something needs to be done to change our behavior to allow us to be happier and healthier in life. Really, this is the foundation of psychology in general. It just happens that when it comes to motivation and emotion, it tends to really strike close to home. I'm not saying watching this video is going to magically help you out, but maybe it'll be start of a journey of self-understanding that can lead you towards better managing these things in your life. Of course, if you are someone who struggles profoundly with issues of motivation and emotion, please reach out to someone and get some professional help. I'm not doing this video as a replacement for that and am not qualified to give clinical advice in any way. Now, this is a general overview video on motivation and emotion. If you want to know more about specific theories of motivation or of emotion, please check out the other shorter and more detailed videos I did on those topics. You can find the links for those videos below. Let's start by talking about motivation. Motivation describes wants or needs that direct behavior towards a goal. We usually divide motivation into intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. An intrinsic motivator is something done to fulfill some sort of internal factor. So for example, I'm a teacher and I love to teach. I do it because of the joy it brings me to teach a subject that I love and to teach people that benefit from learning from me. Those are all intrinsic factors. They include things like personal fulfillment, a sense of purpose, and a sense of well-being or happiness that comes from doing something. Extrinsic motivators are ones that arise from external factors. So if I were to say that I'm a teacher, but the only reason why I do it is for the money. Believe me when I say, by the way, regardless of if it's an elementary school teacher, high school teacher, or college, there is virtually no teacher that I know that's saying that they're only doing it for the money. I mean, it's not like we get paid a whole lot for doing our jobs. However, that would be an example of a purely extrinsic factor. They include things like getting money or some sort of material gain, receiving praise, public recognition, or higher status for doing something. I'm doing it because of some sort of gain that I'm getting externally. Now, even though we talk about this in terms of two categories, it's really worth noting that these are highly individualistic. Two people can do the exact same job for completely different reasons. Also, very few things are 100% intrinsic or extrinsic. I love to teach for the reasons I mentioned earlier, but I have to be honest that I probably wouldn't be doing it for free either. The extrinsic reward of being paid definitely factors into it. We also often view intrinsic motivators as being purer and more noble than extrinsic. After all, me saying I want to teach only because of the passion I have for teaching sounds a whole heck of a lot better than me saying I'm just doing it for the money. However, we really should avoid thinking of it in that way. Sometimes it's also fine to have things motivate you for different reasons. This comes up when we talk about something called the overjustification effect. The overjustification effect says that intrinsic motivation can tend to be diminished when extrinsic motivation is given. Let me give you an example. My best friend and I both love to cook barbecue. We've even done barbecue competitions. In fact, this may be surprising to a lot of you, but we've actually won quite a few barbecue competitions. Naturally, we thought about how awesome it would be to 
take something that we love to do, like cooking barbecue, and make money off of it by doing a food truck or maybe even saving up money and buying a restaurant. The idea here is that you're getting a monetary or extrinsic gain from doing an intrinsic behavior. So you think it'd be great to do what you love to do and get paid for it. Sometimes that can work out, but often what happens is that all the hassles that come with the extrinsic factors can diminish the intrinsic value you get from doing something you love. Think of it this way. How much would my friend and I still love cooking barbecue if now we have to do it for work instead of something that we just wanted to do for fun? Would we still love cooking barbecue if now we have to figure out all the financial aspects of having our own business? What about dealing with angry customers and one-star reviews online? What about having to find, train, and keep employees that care as much about our business as we do? You can probably see why my friend and I never did this. And it's a great example of how the over-justification effect can work. Another important factor that influences our motivation deals with our patience level. This was famously shown in a study first done in 1972 called the Stanford Marshmallow Study. And yes, that's actually the real name of the study. This study involved a large group of children and tested their ability to resist temptation when it came to eating marshmallows. Basically what happened was that the children were given a choice. They could eat a marshmallow that was placed in front of them now but if they waited with the marshmallow still in front of them for 10 minutes, they'd be given a second marshmallow and they could eat both of them. This study has been reproduced tons of times since then and in many different variations. There have been animal cracker studies and candy studies and even cookie studies. They did variations of the study with children as well as with adults and have even tried to connect the results of the studies as being a predictor of success in life, although this is kind of controversial. Oftentimes, we look at problems with motivation as being a lack of motivation, when that really isn't the case. Typically, it's just that something else is motivating somebody more. A kid that eats the marshmallow immediately wasn't lacking in motivation to have two marshmallows. They were just more motivated by having that one marshmallow in front of them, rather than wanting to wait for a second one. Why do some students struggle with studying? It isn't because they lack motivation at all. It's usually because something else is more interesting and fun for them to do. For most of us, we engage in the things we want to do until feelings of guilt, shame, or anxiety about failure build up to the point that we feel compelled to do the things we have to do. Sometimes we also can be our own worst enemy in this regard. We can tend to set goals that are too high, that are really difficult for us to stick with. I mean, this is one of the classic traps people find themselves in when it comes to things like dieting. Maybe a New Year's resolution is to lose weight, so you start with some really extreme diet only to find that midway through January you're stopping at a fast food restaurant to eat a cheeseburger. One of the ways that most people suggest you stay motivated is to have realistic goals and just change a few things at a time and to also focus more on the immediate benefits. Going back to the idea of immediate gratification, if you're on a diet and are doing it to lose weight, it may take a really long time before you start seeing those results. In the meantime, all you're getting from the diet is a lot of hard work without any real benefit. I see this with students that get burned out from going to college. Their goal may be to become a doctor or a lawyer and make a ton of money, but they don't realize they have a whole lot of years with a whole lot of schooling and not too much money between now and then. They get discouraged and they usually end up giving up. Changing your focus to include more immediate goals is a good way to get around this. Dieting, and not just focusing on the overall weight loss, but also on how much better you feel or how much money you're saving by not eating out all the time, can help a person stay more focused and motivated. Going to school and focusing not just on becoming a doctor or a lawyer years down the road, but also looking at short-term goals and achievements to keep you motivated and make you feel rewarded along the way helps prevent a student from getting too burnt out. 
Again, these are not meant to be easy fixes, but can certainly help you out a little bit if these are things that you tend to struggle with. There are many other theories that expand upon these general concepts and talk about how we are motivated differently depending on different factors. The instinctive theory of motivation puts an emphasis on us fulfilling instinctual behavior that deals with things like survival and procreation and says those behaviors lead to stronger motivation. The drive reduction theory of motivation places emphasis on motivation being tied to maintaining homeostasis. The optimum arousal theory ties motivation with mental stimulation. I talk about all these theories as well as Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the self-determination theory in a separate video, so be sure to check that video out. Moving on, I wanted to talk about emotion for a little bit. Emotion is a subjective state of being that we often describe as our feelings. A lot of times we confuse emotion and mood as being the same thing, but they are different. First, mood is usually thought of as being less intense, but longer lasting than emotions. Second, mood is usually believed to be more automatic and less consciously recognized. Just like with motivation, there are a few different theories on emotions. Specifically, there are three, which are known as the James Lang theory, the Cannon Bard theory, and the two factor theory. They all deal with varying ideas revolving around a debate that has persisted in psychology for a while about which comes first with emotions, feelings or thoughts. This question is known as the primacy debate. Both the James Lang and Cannon Bard theories hold that feelings influence our thoughts and come first. Whereas the two factor theory places more emphasis on cognitive factors in influencing our feelings. I discuss all three of these theories in my video on theories of emotions. So make sure you check that out. Both motivation and emotion have some similarities with one another. For starters, we tend to not recognize the amount of control we have in moderating our motivation and our emotion. This is especially true of emotions, with some people tending to feel as if they're slaves to their emotions. Additionally, both emotion and motivation have a lot to do with a person's ability to self-regulate. Self-regulation is the process by which a person effortfully controls behavior to pursue important objectives. As I mentioned at the start of this video, the goal isn't to come up with some life-changing series of concepts in a few short minutes, but rather to start you on a journey of self-discovery, understanding, and yes, self-regulation that may help you live a happier and healthier life down the road. Thanks for watching, everybody.